Hello, I'm Megan, a youth at Westminster. Uh, thank you for joining us this week for worship. We don't have many announcements this week, but we do want to let you know that our youth group will be taking on Operation Backyard this week. We hope that you keep us in your prayers to be God's hands and feet as we work and hopefully make a stronger connection with the homeowner that we'll be working with. Um, we want to say thank you to all the people that reached out and helped us and offered to bring us lunches. We appreciate you. And now let's keep going with our worship. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join us in singing our first hymn.
Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled against God. Let us then renounce our willfulness and seek his mercy by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Gracious God, we come before you in humility to confess our sins. The light that shines through the cross illuminates the many ways that we fail to live as your people. Forgive us for being more quarrelsome than compassionate, more self-protective than giving, more close-minded than open-hearted. Forgive us for letting differences bind us to our essential unity. Forgive us Brothers and sisters, when deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, God forgives our transgressions. Be at peace, for God restores and strengthens you and waters your soul in its parched and inaccessible places. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Good morning and welcome to Time with the Children. Last week we talked about loving our neighbor as ourselves and this week our middle and high school students are doing just that. They're going to work on a project called Operation Backyard where they're going to go to a local woman's home and help her with some projects. They'll be socially distanced six feet apart but they're going to be helping her paint and work on some projects she has around her house. And that's something that our youth are doing just out of the goodness of their hearts. They're not getting paid to do this work. They're not getting anything back except for the satisfaction of helping a neighbor in need. And I think that's a wonderful thing that they're doing. So I think while they're doing that, we could do a few things. I think we could pray for them and hope that they are able to help this woman in many ways and that they'll be able to learn something in return. And I also think we can encourage them. So if you see somebody who's working on these projects, you can tell them how grateful you are for what they're doing. And I also think we can learn from them and we can try to do some of that hard work ourselves. So maybe you could, an example I was thinking that I might do with Lila is we could go through her toy bin and find some toys that she might not be playing with anymore and donate them to a local charity organization like Goodwill or CARM or Habitat Restore. So maybe you can go through some of your things and help a neighbor in need. Let's say a prayer. Dear loving God, thank you for the gift of neighbors. Remind us to serve them with the love that you've shown us. Amen. The first scripture for today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, 
verses 10 through 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I pur purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off.
Our gospel lesson for today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what has, was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was grown, sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My husband and I are transplanted Texans. Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we left the brown, dry, flat land of West Texas and moved to this lush, humid, thickly vegetated terrarium called East Tennessee. We couldn't believe all the trees and green vegetation here. We like to say it was screaming green. The first time we visited the Smoky Mountains, a ranger explained to us that they had to regularly clear the open spaces to keep the forest from taking over. We'd never heard of such a thing. Back in West Texas, we literally lived near a town called No Trees, Texas. But here, trees seem to grow anywhere, and they grow quickly. That's how I've imagined the rich soil in the parable of the sower. A place where scattered seed, thrown with abandon, could easily take root and thrive. But it began to occur to me that desert farming was likely way different than farming here in this part of the country. I found out that ancient desert farmers would often fling seed over furrows of plowed ground after a rain with little care to where the seed fell. Penny Shantz reminded me that in the desert, some seeds, including wildflower seeds, sometimes lay dormant for years and only begin to grow when they've received enough rain. This parable is the first of seven parables that will be told in the next verses of Matthew. Our scripture tells us that Jesus told the first parable while in a boat on a lake, speaking to the large crowd which had gathered on the shore. This was the same busy Sabbath day that the Pharisees questioned Jesus about working on the Sabbath, feeding the disciples and healing the people. Well, Jesus healed more people as he made his way to the lake, so they followed him, and they also wanted to hear what he had to say. So Jesus began by telling them what some editors have entitled the parable of the sower. In my early encounters with this parable, I was prone to see the story as personification. I hope that I was not any of the first three soils. I didn't want to be the hard ground where nothing grew. The rock soil that would indicate that I was shallow, I didn't want to be that either. And I didn't want to be the soil that was in the thorns, where potentially any potential would get choked and destroyed. I wanted to be the seed that grew in the rich soil, the seed that always bore fruit. The latter half of our scripture today definitely favors bearing lots of fruit. Many scholars think this parable 
should be named something else. They think it should be named the parable of the soils. And then the question would be, what kind of soil are you when it comes to the Word of God? Could the Word take root in your soil? As I've learned more about the parable, if I'm honest, I'm probably all the soil types. I have days when I miss the point. The Word of God just goes right over my head and out of my sight, and I'm completely blind to God's grace. But then there are days when I get inspired to read or meditate or pray, and that usually lasts until I get my first text or until the oatmeal in the microwave is done. And then sad to say, I have moments when real growth gets stunted by overgrowing thorns of my own distractions and selfish priorities. But thanks be to God, I do have some days that I recognize the abundance of God's grace and the good news of God's word. And maybe I even get to share that with other people. I recently encountered yet a third perspective on this parable. The parable could be a story about God's generous abundance. The sower flings seeds with abandon, tossing seeds everywhere. Doesn't that seem crazy? Just tossing them everywhere. Every time I've been anywhere near farming or planting, people carefully bury the seeds in just the right depth of soil to make sure they have the best chance of growing. Can you imagine just throwing seed everywhere? But as I, I mentioned, that was a technique of ancient farming. Scattering seed is one type of abundance. The other is kind of over the top. It's the seed that fell on the good soil and bore fruit. It's another kind of abundance. The scripture says the seed on good soil yielded lots of fruit. It said a hundredfold, some was 60-fold, and some was 30-fold. Well, to put that into context, a sevenfold yield would be a really great harvest. A tenfold yield would be actual abundance that would be hard to believe. A thirtyfold yield would feed a village for a year. And then I guess a hundredfold yield would, I don't know, buy you a condo on the Sea of Galilee, maybe. It would be unheard of. It's the kind of abundance you only dream about. And it's a way of illustrating God's generous, generous grace. This idea of abundance is where our Gospel and New Testament lessons kind of connect. The book of Isaiah was written over the course of two centuries. It's divided into three sections. And the 55th chapter is actually the end of the second section. It's thought to be written at a time when the Jews were ending their Babylonian exile and returning to Jerusalem after decades of captivity. For the first time in decades, the Jews who were returning to their homeland could see a glimmer of hope and a possibility of abundance in their lives. That abundance is reflected in today's portion of Isaiah, when the writer speaks of rain and snow coming down from heaven that makes the earth bud and flourish. The mountains and hills will burst into song and trees will clap their hands. Instead of thorns, there will be cypress, and instead of uh, briars, myrtle will grow. But why is the author expecting to see these beautiful signs of abundance? That's explained in verse 11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Like the sower whose widely flung seed yields abundance, Isaiah's claim is the word of God will yield abundance as well. In short, the verse is saying God keeps God's promises. It may, be instant, it may not be instantaneous. It may even take generations. But the word of God accomplishes God's purpose. Reverend and theologian John L. Thomas speaks of nature's celebration in Isaiah 55. He compares it, he, well, he compares the exiled Jew's movement towards hope to his experience attending church. And here's what he has to say. We in the black church are not celebrating just for celebration's sake. As indicated in the prophetic claims of Isaiah, our hope is grounded in real observable change. 
Just as seasons are recognized by changing colors of the leaves, the people of God will know their lives have been restored when thorns have been replaced by cypress, the briar by myrtle. Liberation means change that is concrete and discernible. The parable of the sower is one of two parables in the Bible that actually includes an interpretation that instructs the hearer that the story has a deeper meaning or message. Throughout all the Gospels, Jesus explains things, and usually he's patient. He, instru he instructs the disciples again and again, even when they're clueless. In this first parable, it seems it's the crowd's turn to be taught by Jesus on how to understand and experience life and faith in a spiritual way. Have you ever heard that theory or experience the phenomenon of learning something like a new word or you learn about a person or a place and then you hear it again repeated somewhere else randomly within 72 hours. It may be an urban legend but I've honestly experienced that a lot and I think maybe it happens because we're actually paying attention. At the beginning of the summer I couldn't remember what hostas were. And 17 work projects later, I've moved hostas, cleared them, trimmed them back, and a few days ago, my brother actually sent me a picture of some new hostas in his garden. Well, today's scriptures have been like that for me. I've seen the sower and Isaiah at work around me in two amazing examples recently. The first is, well, last week I mentioned that I had been out of town and returned after a week off. We went on a little vacation to the Charleston area where we stayed in someone's mother-in-law apartment and mostly hung out because, you know, hardly anything is open these days. Well, one day we decided to drive into Charleston to walk along the waterfront. As we drove in, we saw Marion Square, the central green space and gathering place in downtown Charleston. It was buzzing with activity. Three huge cranes were hovering over a large statue which was fenced off, and small crowds of masked onlookers were watching from the shade of the park's live oak trees around the perimeter. It occurred to us that this was the removal of a statue. We quickly parked, donned our masks, and joined the onlookers. The formidable statue, which was on top of a 10-story concrete pillar, was that of John C. Calhoun. He was the seventh vice president of the United States but he was also a South Carolina congressman and senator who spent his life and career unapologetically protecting, facilitating, and promoting slavery in the United States. He had been looming over everybody since the statue was put up there in 1898. The workers had been trying to cut the statue free from concrete pillar since midnight, and we got there in mid-afternoon, so they'd been at it about 15 hours. In the two and a half hours we watched and waited, we used our phones to try to learn more of the story of what was going on. We found out the statue had been a source of conflict and pain since the post-Civil War Reconstruction when it was placed in the center of Charleston. For over a century, scores of groups had petitioned its removal with no success. But this week happened to be the fifth anniversary of the shooting at Mother Emanuel AME Church, which was only one block away. There are many church steeples in that Marion Square area. There are lots of churches, and they all seem to have a view of that statue. That tragic anniversary, combined with the continued murders of black citizens by police, motivated the Charleston City Council to have the statue removed immediately. This removal happened within 24 hours of their vote, which, by the way, was unanimous. Those seeds of grace that had been dormant and scorched and ignored finally had a chance to bear fruit. And it was such an amazing privilege to be there. There was a peaceful rainbow of people watching together. We were socially distanced and had masks on. Families with children were there, older people standing for hours in the heat younger people with friends and spouses, and one man near us was broadcasting it to friends and family on his phone. He had been there all night and was not at all self-conscious about speaking up, so we heard what he was saying. 
At one point, he pointed his camera at a cloud, and he said, See that black cloud? That's God coming to watch. He might even be coming down to help. A couple of minutes before 5 p.m., they lowered the cutting crew, and we knew that removal was imminent. At 5 o'clock exactly, the Lutheran church chimed its hourly cycle. But another church, the church bell somewhere near us, chimed the hymn Amazing Grace. The woman that was next to me looked at me and said, is that for him because he's coming down. Then without warning or fanfare, the crane lifted the statue off the giant pillar and slowly lowered it to the ground. I'm really happy that I actually remembered to look at the other people as this was happening. There were lots of tears and cheers and there was singing too. This was concrete change. God keeps God's promise. The other example of seeing the sower at work is when I work with the Westminster youth. You heard from Megan that we're going to be working for Operation Backyard this week. The youth have a pattern of summer mission work and also spiritual formation experiences. They're very loyal to and enthusiastic about these events, programs like Operation Backyard, Appalachia Service Project, WOW Urban Ministry, Pilgrimages, and Montreat. Seed is scattered lavishly at every one of these events. Seeds of hope with those for whom we work. Seeds of inspiration for those who support the work, like you all. And of course, for those involved in the work, seeds of commitment to continue doing the work and helping improve the world. And I know the commitment will continue. I see it continue. I have the privilege of witnessing these youth growing into adulthood. And I know that they are continuing to spread and scatter seeds of hope, grace, and God's word. The kids that we sent out into the world are and have been doing things like volunteering, defending, preaching, and teaching. We even have a college crew joining us after they get off work this week. They wanted to be part of the project as well. Isn't God's grace amazing? God's word accomplishes God's purpose. The sower's seed will bear fruit. And some days we get the chance to help that along. Alleluia and amen.
So our young people are going to spend this week doing Operation Backyard, working at a house. And so it's our tradition to commission them uh, to this work. So I want you to join me as we do this litany of commissioning uh, for our young adults as they do their Operation Backyard. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. To all of you youth and adults, the grace poured out on you as members of the body of Christ is all you need to answer your calls as Christians because it is God's grace. By God's grace we are saved and given the strength to grow in faith and to serve Christ. Today, like so many before you, God has called you to service, to grow in faith, learning, and fellowship by becoming part of Operation Backyard Team. Show that you intend to answer that act by calling Show that you intend to answer that call by answering this question. Do you welcome the responsibility of representing Westminster Presbyterian Church? And will you seek to follow Christ in all that you do and stay where renovating the home of Mrs. Rennell? If so, say, I do and I will. I do and I will. Do you, the members of Westminster, confirm the call of God to our sisters and brothers to grow in faith, learning, and fellowship by participating in Operation Backyard? If so, say, we do. We do. We support them with your prayers this week, welcome them warmly when they return, and pester them enthusiastically for stories about their experience. If so, say, we will. We will. Faithful God, you are always near. Be with your servants on this week of service and guide their way in accord with your will. Be a companion for them along the journey, a guide at crossroads, strength in their weariness, shelter on the way, shade against the heat, light in the darkness, and a comforter in their discouragements. As they travel and build a new relationship with Mrs. Rennell, may they continually feel your presence, bravely answer your call, and plant it deep into their beings. We ask these things together through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, you are commissioned as representatives of the body of Christ in this place to embark on your week of service for Operation Backyard. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God among them. Amen. So in the days ahead, may you remember the Lord loves us with abundant love and showers us with his grace every day, every moment of every day. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Oh.